Hey there. Uh, Mark Stratton, as Susan said. Uh, I'm in the Fishery Science Department at VIMS. Uh, my advisor is Rob Latour. And I'm going to be talking about the beginnings of my dissertation work today uh, involving the spatial and seasonal patterns of the nearshore fish community along much of the eastern seaboard. And what I mean by nearshore is not in the estuaries, but in the coastal ocean just offshore from the beaches. So think about 20 to 30 feet in water depth. Um, and not to say that a lot of the species that live in that area don't also live in the estuaries, they do. Um, but this particular area of the ocean is, is important for multiple reasons. Uh, it has a high diversity of species, and additionally, it is very productive. So a lot of the seafood that we eat from the coastal ocean originates and is caught in this uh, narrow strip of, of ocean. So I'd like to start by talking about how certain scientists, like myself, uh, like to separate out and group things according to how similar or how dissimilar they are. And we do that in the fishery management, management world, too. So here's a, here's a map of the South Atlantic management region uh, that we use in the fisheries management world. And that area, shown in uh, dark blue there, has some unique physical and biological properties. And that's why it was designated as separate. We also did that for the Mid-Atlantic region. We've, we've heard that term today a couple times. So this is another area of the ocean that we have deemed to have unique physical and biological properties. But as you might expect, um, by drawing a line in the ocean, we're really not stopping the dynamic processes that occur uh, with, within this area of, of the coast. So there's always going to be some level of connectivity between these different regions. So that was my overall goal for today was to determine the level of connectivity between these two management regions uh, using the nearshore fish community as a model. So if you could imagine, uh, some of the similarities between these two regions might be uh, they share uh, a suite of certain species that live in both areas, or alternatively, some of these fish species migrate between the two management regions. So we know this, we know this information multiple times over for different species. But no one's really looked at it from a community perspective. So in general, what are the community patterns uh, for connectivity for these two management regions for the fish community? So I have two uh, large research surveys that are underpinning my work. The first is the CMAP survey, uh, shown here on the bottom. This survey is operated out of Charleston, South Carolina. It's a bottom trawl survey, so they target juvenile and, and adult ground fishes. And the CMAP survey, it stands for Southeast Area Monitoring and Assessment Program. And CMAP operates from Cape Canaveral down here at the, uh, in Florida all the way up the coast to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And the other survey that I'll be utilizing data from is the NEMAP survey. It's operated out of VIMS, and that stands for the Northeast Area Monitoring and Assessment Program. And NEMAP operates in the coastal ocean in the nearshore zone. Uh, they pick up the, the sampling range at Cape Hatteras and they sample all the way up into southern New England. So the whole idea for my project was to kind of compare data sets between these two surveys uh, and see what the similarities are and to see if they actually are comparable. So when each of these surveys pulls a trawl in a given location, which all the locations during 2008 to 2012 are shown each by a green dot. So as you can see, the, the density of sampling is pretty intense all the way up the coast. There's very good sampling coverage. When they pull a trawl in a certain spot, which is about 20 minute tow, uh, they will bring the catch on board, identify all the species in it, uh, and then sort those species so they can count them and weigh them uh, collectively as each species. And if we consider the types of species and the abundances of those species in a given area, we can call that the community composition of that area. So I'll be using that term a lot. So I was talking about dividing up the ocean, compartmentalizing the ocean, um, and trying to figure out if that was a valid thing to do. So here I am again dividing up the ocean. Um, the first thing I did was I specified what I'll call subregions. And these are actually already, this was already actually done uh, prior to me looking at these data. NEMAP and CMAP designated uh, these subregions along their survey uh, routes all the way up and down the coast in order to make sure that they uh, sampled evenly up the coast. So every year, some samples are taken from each of these uh, different subregions. For my purposes, it's useful to use these subregions as kind of independent samples. So each subregion, I'm going to characterize the community composition of the fish, fish assemblage in that specific area, and then compare the community composition between each and every one of those subregions. 
and NEMAP has 14 subregions, while CMAP has 24. And so all in all, there's 38 subregions. So the method I use to evaluate uh, how is to see if, if some of the lines in the ocean that we have drawn, to see if they uh, are really more interconnected than we think, the method I use is cluster analysis. And you may not have heard of this, maybe you have, but basically I, was, I can uh, draw a comparison to creating a family tree. So if you've ever seen a family tree or made a family tree, uh, you've done cluster analysis in a sense. So here's an example of a blank family tree here. So instead of Uncle Eddie in one of those boxes, um, what I, for my purposes, each one of those branches is going to be one of those 38 subregions. So in the end, if two of the branches that are close together, say in the top left here, uh, if there are two subregions, one subregion in each of those boxes or on a branch, uh, those two subregions are going to be more similar to one another in community composition. And on the opposite side of the same coin, branches that are on the other side of the tree are going to have a very different community co composition to some of those branches on the left, for instance. So without further ado, here's some results. This is, a, this is basically my family tree here for each of the 38 subregions. And as you can see, it's not very pretty to look at. So each one of the subregions is, is represented as a branch on this cluster dendrogram. So, so we don't have to look at that all day. Um, I, what I've done is I've basically pruned this tree into an appropriate number of branches that the statistical analysis told me was, was good. And I've taken those different clusters, those big branches, and I've mapped them on the coastline for us to look at. So first thing to notice is that out of this analysis, there were seven clusters of subregions that came out. You can see them color-coded and labeled all the way up and down the coast. So here's cluster one in the bottom left, all the way up to Long Island. We have a, a unique cluster seven. So each one of those clusters is anywhere from two to ten, say about ten subregions. And the subregions within each of those clusters have very similar community structure, whereas they might have been very different from a from a different from another uh, cluster. So seven clusters. The next thing to notice is that I color-coded these different clusters to indicate where the major break was in this family tree. And that occurred right at Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And if you remember, that is where that break is in the fishery management regions that we use to manage our fisheries with. So it appears that whoever generated those uh, different management regions was onto something, at least represented by uh, this, this community of fishes in the nearshore zone. So we can see that's the major break, and that, you know, that makes sense. We know that these two regions have unique physical and biological properties, so it's just more evidence for that. Another thing to notice is that uh, we do have, there's kind of some patchiness uh, in the clusters where you know, one subregion here in, in near Myrtle Beach area is actually more similar to areas around Georgia. So there's always going to be some variability in this composition, a community composition. So that was spring data. I forgot to mention that. That's only spring data. If we look at fall data, we see a similar but somewhat different picture. So again, we have the, I, I pruned the tree so that we have seven clusters. That was recommended by the statistical analysis. So instead of the major break occurring between warm colors and cool colors, instead of that occurring at Cape Hatteras, it occurs somewhere south of Cape Hatteras. So maybe that management boundary isn't as hard and fast as uh, we should treat it. And the next thing, so the, the warm and cool boundary maybe, maybe occurs down here uh, near Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, but we also have some greater patchiness in the community composition. So this subregion here in southern North Carolina uh, was actually more similar to community composition in New Jersey than it was in, in neighboring South Carolina. So to me, what this, what this says to me is that we have, there's a little bit more greater uh, connectivity between these two management regions. Uh, than we often maybe like to admit. And from a single species perspective, like I said, uh, we know this. We know that certain species cross these imaginary lines that we've drawn, uh, but no one's really quantified it uh, in a, at, at the community level. So if we look at both fall and spring, the spring, I've superimposed the spring uh, color scheme on the outside we can get a, see that nice comparison. So overall, we still see that general split between the South Atlantic region and the Mid-Atlantic region in terms of community composition. There are some differences between the seasons. One thing to notice is that I've drawn some lines where we have common breakpoints, where we have 
fr common tre uh, tree branches. And that indicates to me that something is going on, regardless of what season it is, something is going on in these areas uh, where the fish community changes more drastically uh, at these spots consistently during every season. So that'll be the, my next step in my research to figure out what exactly is unique about these certain locations in terms of the environmental characteristics, such as uh, temperature changes, temperature gradients, as well as specific habitat characteristics. And I will say that, you know, we're, as, as students, we're always trying to find the, the applications of our, of our research. It's really hard for me to, to draw those kind of conclusions with this aspect of my dissertation, uh, because it really is, for me, it's kind of just fun with fishes. But um, what, what this aspect of my work is allowing me to do is really get an intimate knowledge of the community that lives along the coast and then devise some really specific hypotheses and ask some really specific questions uh, that, really are, that really will be applicable to the management process. So in case you're wondering what any of these, uh, I, I included about 200 species in my analysis. So it really does cover a broad suite of animals. Here are, just, here are four critters that went into this analysis and had a little bit more weight in terms of the results. Um, I won't get into their life histories or anything, but I think they demonstrate the, nicely the diversity of fishes in our area, especially the, you know, the different life forms. These, uh, these species have very different ecological niches, um, and it's, it's pretty astounding, actually, if you, if you t take a close look. So th thanks for listening. Thanks to these folks, especially the NEBAP and CMAP crews, uh, for all their many years of hard work, and thanks to Sea Grant for this opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually forgot to mention that. Thank you. Um, yeah, those the lines that we draw in the ocean, they're not just for the fishes. They are, they are real human issues that we're dealing with when we're, when we're trying to manage these fisheries. So for instance, some of the lines in those subregions that I had occurred right at state, state lines. Mm -hmm. And so these, fishery, these surveys, the purpose of them is to provide data to the stock assessment scientists for management purposes. Um, so there's, there's, you're right, there's more than just the biology that goes into considering uh, you know, how we separate out the ocean. And uh, the, the politics play a huge part of it. I mean, without, without the human element, we wouldn't have any reason to study fisheries. So, of course, that's very important. So, yeah, I was trying to kind of evaluate uh, those, those, those management lines, which are drawn because of the biology as well as the politics. I was trying to evaluate them just from the biological perspective. I think it would, I would, it would further your work. That's why I'm asking you that. From an application point of view. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do because man, from at least the scope that I'm looking at, I'm kind of stepping, taking a step back and looking at the whole community. Mm -hmm. Rarely does fishery management ever make a decision based on the entire fish community. We're, we're after certain species, um, and that's kind of the, the uh, evolution of this whole ecosystem-based management revolution. Um, so it's, it's tr the, the trick is trying to find ways to uh, apply some of these broader ecological analyses uh, in a meaningful way in management. And it's, it's hard. So that's what, that's what drives me. Yes, sir. Do you go out on the crawl surveys yourself or do you just do what you did? I do go out. I do go out. I've been on the CMAP survey for the past uh, two years. Uh, another part of my dissertation work is, is looking at the food web in these areas. So I've, I've collected about 10,000 fish guts uh, on the CMAP survey over the past two years. Uh, I haven't yet been on the NEMAP survey, but it's, it's run out of them, so I'll definitely have that opportunity soon. How, how has that changed your perception, you know, scientists working with fishermen, et cetera? So I didn't mention this, but actually the surveys are run by scientists. So actually there, it's, there is a little bit of a disconnect there. I haven't... But, you know, in general, uh, being so in the field... The boats are run by fishermen, right? Actually, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, the fishermen run their own boats. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, the, the, you know, the data that I'm working with is what we call fishery independent. Um, yeah, that specific vessel is run by, by an actual fishing captain. 
Um, so that's, that's kind of a unique situation, um, and it's definitely a, a bonus, I think, for everybody, the scientists and the fishermen, because there's a little more transparency in how these data are collected. Yeah, the So that's another area of the next step of my research. I tried to get some, some rough calculations together. Um, certainly there are some species that uh, have more weight in determining the results. And typically, the way that I structured my analysis, typically it's going to be the uh, more abundant ones. Uh, so there are certain species that kind of dominate the system, like Ryan was talking about croaker. Croakers are very abundant species. So in certain areas where we have high densities of croaker, uh, they may play a, a larger part in determining where those uh, clusters separated out. Is it numbers or weight? I use weight, right. but you could go either way. Any other questions? Thank you.